Okay. Great. So hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Adriana Bankston. I'm currently the CEO and managing publisher for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. And I want to provide a brief background on, on the journal for those that may not be familiar. So I'll share our website in the chat. We are an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed publication. We cover every corner of science and technology policy and through the journal, we bolster research and writing credentials for early career scholars in science policy and encourage them to engage in policy discourse and debate. We publish op-eds, technology assessments, policy memos, analyses, white papers, book reviews, or workshop proceedings, and other research articles. And we also promote the publications through our global mailing lists and events such as workshops, webinars, and the podcast where we interview published authors. You can follow JSPG on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And we also have the YouTube channel where we post all of our recordings and we'll post today's recordings as well. And if you wanna follow us, I'll post our accounts in the chat as well. And then we have a newsletter where you can sign up for our future events as well. So uh, in relation to today's event, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, this relates to our call for papers that was released late last year. GSPG and UCL Steep launched a call for papers and competition focused on the latest policy developments and issues in science diplomacy with the submission deadline of April 3rd, 2022. <clears throat> the issue is supported in kind by outreach partners from INCSA, the European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance, and the Global Young Academy Incubator Group on Science Diplomacy in the Americas. And I will also share the link to the call for papers and our events in the chat as well. So you can go to the next slide. Great. So this webinar is the first in a series of events on engaging thought leaders in the field to discuss the most important topics for the next generation to focus on within science diplomacy. The second webinar will be on February 15th, and we will also have a writing workshop in March to help prospective authors improve their submissions to the issue and practice policy writing around diplomacy topics. We encourage you to live tweet today about the webinar and tag us. And, um, as we've done in the past, whoever tweets the most will also have the opportunity to share their impressions about the event on our blog. So I'll share our accounts uh, as well um, and our partners. So next slide. So with that introduction, we can move into today's event. Just a few logistics. Please mute your microphones and turn off your videos. And during the discussion, feel free to ask questions in the chat for our speakers. You can send them to me directly uh, or to our moderator, JC, through the private chat. Um, for some background on the event, as we know, the world is still missing many crucially needed interfaces and bridges between science and diplomacy, and better structures, policies, and governance for science diplomacy are needed to be able to address some of these complex worldwide problems that are underpinned by science and technology issues. And this webinar will reflect on these crucial interfaces, both at the national and international level and how they can be improved. So we have a really distinguished panel here today and we're really grateful for their participation. So I'll just introduce our moderator um, who can then introduce the panelists. Our moderator for today is JC Modut, who is a lecturer in science diplomacy at UCL Steep and also JSPG Senior Advisor for International Engagement. JC holds a PhD in astrophysics from the Paris Observatory and a master's in international relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. He was previously a research scholar at the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a deputy director of Science Diplomacy Center at Tufts University. He worked on ESA and NASA satellite missions at the CNRS and at the California Institute of Technology and was a project officer for the International Astronomical Union focusing on scientific development issues. And with that, I'll turn it over to JC. And while he's speaking, I'll share information on the panelists and how you can reach them um, on social media as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. 
Dr. Benson, for the overview uh, of the journal and for your uh, kind introduction uh, as well. So uh, I hope all can hear us well now. I, it's my absolute pleasure to, to be here and to moderate this exciting event with uh, such a wonderful panel of distinguished guests, as you'll hear in a minute. Uh, but before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to say a, a few quick words of introduction. Um, so first, while uh, as uh, Dr. Benson mentioned, I'm also a volunteer for the journal with which I've been involved for a few years now, I'm speaking today with a different hat on that is in my capacity of lecture at University College of London in the UK, where I work at the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy that's also known as STEEP informally. So I'm very happy that JSPG and UCL STEEP could collaborate on uh, such, such a, a special topic. And I would like to thank everyone at JSPG for their hard work uh, in putting together this special issue and, and series of events together, uh, which aims at engaging the, the younger generation further into science and policy. So um, let me first quickly introduce UCL STEEP uh, today, which is sponsoring the special issue. So very briefly, the department was founded in the recognition that science, technology, and engineering expertise are vital to tackling today's most pressing global challenges. And its staff work on fields as diverse as energy, the environment, cities, digital technologies, future policies, and science diplomacy. Uh, so the department aims to inform the connection between policy and research through teaching, research, and practical work on policy impact itself, the latter being core to the department. Uh, in terms of educational programs, the one-year Masters of Public Administration is Steve's flagship program, which provides skills and tools to work at the interface between SDE and policy. And uh, applications for the next uh, MPA close on the 31st of March for those who would like to apply. Uh, Steve also has a doctoral training program, which centers on fostering the development of world-class interdisciplinary researchers and practitioners, and for which applications are currently open. So uh, with that introduction, I would also like to quickly thank our outreach sponsors who have kindly helped with the event. So the International Network for Government Science Advice, the EU Science Diplomacy Alliance, and the Global Young Academy. So my uh, particular thanks also to Grant Mills, Christian Allen, and El Fidel for their help. So in terms of the uh, panel today, our panelists will uh, today delve into this more in more detail, but as Dr. Benson men mentioned, uh, indeed science, technology, and engineering underpin many of the global challenges that the world is facing today. Um, uh, climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic are a somber reminder of it, uh, but there's so many more uh, that need to be addressed today. And these globalized, uh, issues require international responses and diplomatic engagement that is informed by science, which makes science diplomacy extremely relevant and ever more needed. Um, but uh, we also know that we are still missing many of such crucially needed interfaces and bridges between science and diplomacy. And we also know that this needs to happen fast. So uh, every idea uh, matters, especially innovative ones, in helping enhance these interfaces further. Uh, and there is an intergenerational uh, barriers and gaps um, that we know of that prevent these ideas uh, to be brought to the fore, which is what we hope that JSPG will help overcome through our collaboration on this uh, special issue. So in a nutshell, uh, today's objective is twofold. Is first inform uh, the audience broadly about the important role of science diplomacy and its interfaces, whether in national or international contexts, in the way that it can address global challenges. Second, it would be to provide the audience with some directions and guidance around topics related to how we can build better structures, policies, and governance for science diplomacy to address these problems, and hence enabling uh, young scholars to publish on these topics in JSPG. Um, so to discuss and answer, answer some of these uh, themes, when we have a, a number of distinguished panelists uh, that today that have been involved in uh, one capacity or another in these uh, interfaces. They've witnessed, witnessed firsthand how nations and international organizations use science diplomacy, deploy science advice in their foreign affairs, 
uh, or may actually lack the capacity to do so and hence to meaningfully engage in these issues that may crucially impact them. So let me introduce uh, our uh, panel uh, today and I will go through the order uh, of the flyer. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Baska Balakrishnan. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan has been an Indian diplomat for 33 years and served as ambassador to uh, India, uh, of India to Greece and Cuba. He has worked in several countries in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East, and for over 10 years with various UN organizations in Geneva and Vienna. Uh, he set up and headed the investment and technology promotion division of the Ministry of External Affairs. Um, uh, concerned with the promotion of foreign investment and technology flows. He was educated uh, at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology uh, in Delhi and Stony Brook University in New York. So uh, thank you for being with us today, Dr. Balakrishnan. It is also my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Marcella O'Hira, who is the Deputy Executive Director uh, and Director of Capacity Building at the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. She holds a, a Master of Arts degree in International Relations, uh, International Economics and Science Technology and the Environment from John Hopkins, and a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations from uh, University of Brasilia in Brazil. So she has designed and launched many innovative capacity building programs to foster science policy interfaces, science advice, diplomacy, transdisciplinary research training, and the development of multinational networks. Uh, she has worked on international technical cooperation at the Brazilian Cooperation Agency and the Division of Technical and Technological Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Affairs of Brazil. So thank you for being with us uh, today. We also have the great pleasure to have Dr. Jan Marco Mueller uh, with us. Jan, uh, Dr. Mueller is the Science and Technology Advisor in the Policy Planning and Strategic Foresight Division of the European External Action Service. Previously, he was acting chief operations officer and coordinator for science to policy and science diplomacy at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna. And prior to this, he helped set up the European Commission's current science advice mechanisms and served as assistant to the EU chief science advisor, Professor Dame Ann Glover. And before that, he uh, spent three years uh, assisting the director general of the Joint Research Center. Uh, and held also many positions at the GRC, as well as in the UK. He holds a PhD in geography, having done his PhD research in Colombia. So last but not least, we're also lucky to have with us today, Dr. Mina Pham, uh, who is the counselor for science and technology at the French embassy in the UK since September, 2020. Uh, an agricultural engineer by training, she obtained a PhD in neurosciences at Université Pierre-Marie Curie and directed the Laboratory of Comparative Neurobiology at Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique. She then held many different positions, such as Deputy Director in the European and International Relations Department of the French Research Agency, CNRS, and uh, headed its European Research and International Cooperation Department before being appointed in 2013 as Counselor for Science and Technology at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. After um, being Vice President for International Relations at PSL in Paris, she has now tran transitioned to her new role at the Embassy since September 2020. So thank you for being with us, uh, Dr. Pham. So uh, maybe we'll work in the reverse order of the presentations now um, to seek the initial remarks from our wonderful panelists. So maybe I'll um, give the floor to Dr. Pham to uh, launch us off and onto this, this wonderful panel. So thank you again for being with us. And uh, you're still muted, uh, Dr. Pham. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very exciting uh, panel. And uh, I hope we will have a very interesting, a very interesting discussion. I have no doubt about that. So uh, through the initial introduction you made, uh, Jean-Christophe, uh, um, as you have seen, I got three different parts in my career. And uh, I started from an individual point of view to a more uh, institutional uh, approach when I was uh, working for universities or, or research bodies. 
And now I have, uh, let's say, a governmental position, which gave me the, uh, the, the mission to, to promote higher education and research French system abroad. So in this three uh, capacity, I think that science diplomacy, I really face uh, science uh, um, diplomacy um, challenges when I was in uh, my capacity of science counselor in Washington DC and then in the UK. When I was in, the, uh, in Washington DC, uh, it was the moment when we were preparing COP21, which was held uh, at the end of uh, 2015 in Paris. And uh, we have launched at that moment more than 15 events in North America, conversation, gathering all kinds of people, discussing about various aspects of climate change. So we gathered scientists, of course, but also people from the, uh, uh, from, uh, the public, students, uh, um, NGOs, uh, stakeholders, politicians, all kinds of people who can discuss about different aspects going from uh, the impact of, um, 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 let's say, uh, extreme events or, or, or a slight um, uh, satellite observation, all kinds of approaches were, were, were described during these uh, conversations. These conversations were called French-American Climate Talks, and it was really a very well uh, chosen name because it was a very uh, important moment where people from different uh, horizons could discuss together. For us, it was uh, as as uh, as diplomats, as science diplomats. It was it was the opportunity also to identify forces in the U.S. who can contribute to help us making COP twenty one a success. So that was my my first experience. And uh, now, more recently, uh, being uh, well in my capacity here in London, I have a second global challenge to face, which is of course not only in London but everywhere in the world which is about uh, COVID-19. Now we do not have yet uh, enough uh, I mean, information on, on what will happen in the next future, but um, as a diplomat here in, in the uh, embassy, I had to answer quite a lot of requests uh, to quite a lot of requests from our French authorities about benchmarking what is happening in the in the UK compared to what happens in France, how the uh, political decision in this country are taken based on the scientific advices, and of course, it's a different way in France or in the UK, and uh, all the the concerns about the universities dealing with students, with international students, etc. So I wanted just to report these two experiences I had in the recent uh, uh, past and which are not uh, small uh, questions, of course. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pham, for, for these uh, initial remarks. And uh, we'll, we'll have, I'm sure, plenty of time to delve into some of uh, your, your uh, thoughts on these interfaces that you, you worked at. So thank you very much um, for this. Uh, if I may now move to uh, uh, Dr. Yen Marco Müller from the OES. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, for the kind invitation. And uh, as you said, I have a PhD in geography, so I claim to be both a natural and a social scientist. But, but I actually, from the beginning, I, I was interested in the science policy interface. On so in the past 20 years, I've worked in this twilight zone between science and policy and, and different functions, um, seeing actually very different types of science advice mechanisms from the inside. And then in the past years, I ventured more and more into the science diplomacy arena, especially when I worked at, at EASA in Vienna. Um, now, I got the opportunity uh, in, in 2020 to become a science advisor in the ES. And uh, perhaps it's important just to say a few words about what the ES, the European External Action Service, is. So we are the diplomatic service of the European Union means we are not a ministry of foreign affairs. So for instance, we don't have consular services because the European Union doesn't give any visas that national member states do. Um, but what we do is actually to coordinate um, EU's foreign policies to make them coherent. And we're also running uh, some 140 delegations around the world, which deal with the international dimension of, of European policies in, in many different aspects. And it's a very young service. So it was established 10 years ago. Um, so uh, this has a disadvantage and an advantage. The disadvantage is we don't have all this legacy and, and institutional weight of, of a national foreign ministry. But because we are very young, uh, we are open for experiments. Nobody tells you we have always done it like this. 
Um, so when I came here, I mean, the initial idea is I'm seconded from the Joint Research Center, which is the science service of the European Commission. And the idea was, okay, I'm a kind of liaison there, but then the pandemic hit and it kind of evolved into a fully fledged um, science advisor position. And um, I'm the first one in this job. And then of course, when you start new in a job, and I started on the 1st of August, 2020, um, then you ask yourself, okay, where am I going to start? And uh, 10 days later, Mr. Putin came to my rescue when he announced the approval of Sputnik V as the first uh, COVID-19 vaccine before even entering phase three clinical trials. <laughs> and said, okay, now that's a good moment to brief the diplomatic colleagues about actually how all the uh, vaccine approval works, what type of vaccines do we have, et cetera. And as you can imagine, COVID-19 and the vaccines have been, kept me busy ever since. Um, writing briefings on the different vaccines, on the variants and, and, and uh, all the rest of it. Advising, of course, our high representative, um, Mr. Morel, but, but also our own delegations, for instance. And one other issue I want to aspect, an aspect I want to flag here, which was also very curious, that the very first day I arrived in my office, I noticed that they had put the office of the science and technology advisor right next door of the office of the advisor on religious affairs and faith. So I thought, okay, that's going to be interesting. And, and actually, I'm, right now I'm with my colleague in a, in a joint project on, uh, which we also do with the US State Department on vaccine hesitancy in Africa. Uh, because there was, for instance, there were so, surveys showing that, for instance, in a country like Niger, uh, almost 90% of the population believe that prayers are more effective than vaccines. So obviously, if we want to vaccinate Africa, science and religion need to team up. And these are kind of uh, interfaces, which I find extremely interesting uh, in my job here. Um, so uh, I'm, of course, also advising on many other issues, uh, you know, be, be it, uh, for instance, dark and quiet skies, where I work with the astronomers or uh, the Arctic, or, or of course, also developing kind of, say, the science diplomacy agenda also in-house here. So this keeps, keeps me very busy, but it's very exciting because actually I'm the first and have the opportunity to, to build many things up. And we are certainly going to discuss further on more about it. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mirna, for, for this, uh, these initial remarks. And I apologize that on my end also, sometimes my connection may be a bit unstable, but uh, I still heard you loud and clear. So that's great. So thank you for this. Uh, uh, maybe we'll move on to uh, Ms. Marcella O'Hira then for, uh, for you to present some of the work and these interfaces that you've been developing. So thank you to... very much, JC. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here, participate with the other colleagues on discussing science diplomacy, the role and the importance growing importance that he has today. Um, Adriana, if you don't mind, yes, thank you. And I'm happy to go after Dr. Miller because he was uh, telling us about, you know, how it is to be a science advisor. And one of the key programs of the II today is how to form science advisors um, to promote science diplomacy and to promote science policy interfaces, especially in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, next slide, please. So instead of uh, speaking about my own experience, I would rather speak about the work of the organization, uh, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, IAI, which uh, everything that we do is about science diplomacy. So I think uh, with some of that introduction, it would help us in the discussion, in you know, sharing some ideas, experiences, and thinking about innovative programs that can really contribute to the ecosystems of science diplomacy around the globe. Uh, the II is an intergovernment organization, so we are not just a national government. We work for 19 governments of the American continent. Uh, the goal, the II, is to augment, to foster scientific knowledge in global environmental change issues. Uh, to better understand what the phenomena are and what are the impacts on various sectors of the economy and for the benefit of society, but also to provide sound information in a timely manner to support government and policy making processes. 
Um, I think the key role of the AI is that it's a tool and it's a venue where both scientists and policymakers can come together to uh, talk about science, to talk about science policy interface, and to talk about science diplomacy as we work under a regional framework. Um, the AI was established in the year of 92 when there was a lot of governance issues in discussing the climate change convention, the biodiversity convention, government leaders preparing for the Rio 92 conference on sustainable development. So within that governmental discussions about sustainability and the role of science in the international framework, that's when the AI was established by several governments from the continent. And the main purpose of the AI is to develop and support collaborative research programs, capacity building, science policy, through a scheme of science diplomacy as we work with 19 governments and very closely with the scientific community from the AI member countries. And of course, the goal is to address those common challenges that are shared by many of the countries, by many of the governments from the region to um, promote a sustainable vision of the Americas, sustainability, development, uh, having the science as the core of our work. So as you can see on the map, we work with 19 countries uh, all the way from North America, including Central America and Caribbean. And uh, we hope that other, uh, there are just a few countries that are not members of the IAI, and we uh, have the goal of increasing the membership as well. The last slide. And what is the work that we do that has the science diplomacy as the core? So we have several programs, science programs, capacity building, more and more focusing on science diplomacy uh, and transdisciplinarity research. And I was just going to mention two or three of our core programs, um, because in our view, those are programs that are strategic for the AI, for the region, in thinking about how we can use scientific information and knowledge, the uptake of science to support policy decision making. Um, as Adriana and JC were mentioning in the beginning, there are so many important global and regional challenges, not only the current pandemic, but also climate change and other transboundary, regional, continental, global challenges, especially when we look at environmental issues and sustainable development. Those are core programs that are shared by many countries that are shared by different fields of science knowledge and also stakeholders. Um, practitioners, you know, people that have other sorts of uh, knowledge that should also be taken into account in this discussion. It's not only the scientific knowledge, but also other um, kinds of knowledge, uh, different sorts of uh, stakeholders, not only governments, but also the private sector and civil society. So there are many challenges that we see, not only in terms of engaging with different sectors, different uh, groups, that have contributions and they have uh, demands and also challenges within the framework of sustainability and of science and policy interface. But uh, two of the programs that we have recently launched, one of them is the II Science Technology and Policy Fellows Program. And I think this is a really um, innovative program for Latin America, the Caribbean especially. And we are very ambitious in trying to develop capacities, not only human, but also institutional uh, capacities for governments, for the private sector as well, in promoting the uptake of science. Um, there's not a school uh, you know, that you can go to to learn how to be a science advisor. I think most of them, like Dr. Miller, they have to learn by doing. And one of the things that we want to do is to facilitate the process placing early career scientists to have a one or two year experience in government agencies, all branches of government, executive, legislative, judiciary, and also exposing them to the different field that is uh, policy making or private sector policy making, but also at the same time, you know, uh, raising awareness with policymakers of the value of science to support evidence based policy, especially when it comes to sustainable development. Um, it's a two way street and we want to contribute and working together 
you know, fellows, policymakers, the scientific communities, senior scientists. And this is a key program for the AI as we see more and more of this challenge of uh, climate change, for instance, needing more of the science knowledge to plan and support decision making in you know, agriculture, energy, water resources, health, so many sectors that are important to society. So we are also providing professional development training to complement the STEP program um, in three pillars that we consider to be key to uh, support our fellows in their role as future science advisors and being liaison between the scientific community and the policy making community. Those pillars are science communication, leadership, in science diplomacy. So one of the core programs is about science diplomacy, how to identify also transboundary issues of common interest, not only coming from the fellows, but also from their host organizations that are based in different countries from the Americas. Um, and um, in addition to develop an important and powerful inter-American network of science policy diplomacy networks that fellows, their host organizations, their participating countries would get engaged together working on various important issues for the continent like polar issues, clean energy, um, land use change, agriculture expansion and impacts on climate change and hydrology. So there are many important aspects that the fellows are identified together with their host organizations in countries. And hopefully with their work that are based on science diplomacy and transdisciplinary collaboration, they will be able to not only develop further skills, what we call you know, uh, power skills to be better either or more uh, effective scientists if they go back to the scientific community, policy makers, if they remain in science, but also to promote that science policy interface and that science diplomacy among their partners from different countries and different regions. Um, in addition to the STEP Fellows Program, um, we also are launching a science diplomacy center this year. And the goal of the center is to provide additional training, not only to scientists, but also to policymakers, getting diplomats engaged, working with scientists on secret projects, on common areas of interest shared by many governments and different agencies, uh, develop a curriculum, de a curriculum development for science diplomacy, but also cross-cutting issues like transdisciplinary research, and looking and supporting national governments on their strategy for science diplomacy. 2018, Panama launched its first national strategy, which was one of the kind for Latin America. Colombia is um, announcing its science diplomacy and many other governments in our region are taking the initiative of having a national or government strategy for science diplomacy. So hopefully the IEI will be a key partner for uh, supporting those governments, those organizations to interact with uh, other countries in sharing experiences, best practices. And um, this is just my introduction. I'll be happy to engage with the audience in discussing other ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sahara, for this very comprehensive overview of uh, the important work that AI is doing in uh, throughout the American continent and uh, definitely looking at many different inter interfaces uh, nationally, uh, regionally, but also internationally. For, so thank you very much. Uh, so let's now, um, last but not least, move to uh, Dr. Balakrishnan. Very lucky to have you here uh, to talk about a little bit more of the, the, the issues that spans a long career. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Modi and uh, uh, Dr. Bankston for having me on this panel and for this opportunity to participate along with so many distinguished uh, panelists and a wide and diverse audience. Well, I started off with the training in theoretical physics with a PhD in 1972, and then I transitioned to diplomacy since 1974. And during my diplomatic career, I worked on many issues of science, technology, and diplomatic negotiations. So I won't go into that. Dr. Modi has already mentioned that in the introduction. 
I wrote a book in 2017 on technology and international relations challenges for the 21st century. And I'm afraid things have happened so fast that the book is probably out of date even within a short time. Since 2018, I'm a science diplomacy fellow at uh, Think Tank RIS in India. And I'm involved in this program on science diplomacy, which is focused on research, networking, and training activities. The focus areas of uh, our work are wide, the climate change and energy, nuclear energy, management of oceans, et cetera. Uh, we are also running a fortnightly newsletter on science diplomacy and an international journal, Science Diplomacy Review. We have conducted training of both Indian and foreign diplomats and other officials at, in science diplomacy. Our main objective is to bring in the perspectives of the global south into the global science diplomacy discourse. Now, a word about how things have changed. Diplomacy has changed hugely. The number and diversity of actors has increased. Earlier, it was conducted between foreign ministries and dealt mostly with political and consular matters. Now, the range of subjects covered has increased greatly. Globalization and communications technology have transformed diplomacy. The main objectives of diplomacy basically are the same. Achieve national security in the broadest sense, a better life and opportunities for citizens, including those living abroad, and addressing global challenges. Now, science and technology has become very important for achieving all these objectives. Science diplomacy means the full integration of science and technology into diplomacy and foreign policy. It can be seen as a subset of science policy. For developing countries, there are certain priorities in science diplomacy. Sustainable development is a very important goal. Enlisting the STEM diaspora living in the advanced countries is also very important. And of course, building up the national science and technology ecosystem is critical. Now, the main actors involved in diplomacy are governments, but is expanded to include business and industry, academia, civil society, religious organizations, youth, women. I think there is a definition of multi-track diplomacy by Dr. Diamond, which has eight distinct tracks, but uh, that is a simplification. All of these uh, actors play a role in science diplomacy as they do in diplomacy in general. Their cooperation is essential to achieve meaningful results. The approach has to be inclusive at national and global levels and multidisciplinary. Greater public education and awareness of science and technology related issues is necessary. Coming to global challenges, the list is growing. Climate change, energy, digital security and cyberspace governance, sustainable development, ocean health, outer space militarization, global health, which includes uh, pandemics, gene therapy and assisted reproduction, food security, water resources, et cetera. All these require governments to work together for the common good, but tensions are growing between several major countries and these need to be managed and contained. So subnational and non-governmental actors must increase their cooperation and put pressure on governments to seek solutions. In some areas such as digital security and cyberspace, actually the delivery of results requires action by diverse actors outside the government. We will need more time to go into detailed discussions on all these issues. Hopefully some of our young participants will be inspired to do research papers on these topics. At RIS, we'll be glad to publish such papers in our journal. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Modi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, for, for these initial remarks. Um, very inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, also glad that we have a wide uh, diversity in the educational backgrounds, as you heard uh, from, from our panelists. Um, and in diversity in, in geographies and, and topics as well, right? So um, very, very good discussion, I'm sure that we'll have about this. I want to uh, acknowledge also that uh, I can see in the rooms that there are um, also some thought leaders in the field that have joined us. So uh, thank you for that. Please uh, be free to you know, share your thoughts in the chat as well or ask questions, the difficult questions to our panelists. Um, we look forward to that. 
So uh, thank you very much all for those for those remarks. Maybe um, we can go back to first say the, the national uh, science diplomacy interfaces, and then we'll move to maybe regional and international interfaces again. Um, so my question maybe would be uh, to Dr. Müller and Do Dr. Pham at first, um, but you know, of course, our other panelists are welcome to jump in as they uh, experience these issues as well. But uh, why is it important to have uh, at the national level uh, interfaces between the world of science and the world of diplomacy? So we've heard some of your initial remarks, but why is it important to have a, a network of science attaché? You know, why is it important to have science advice within foreign affairs, uh, even at the, uh, say, EU uh, level, as Dr. Mueller has, has remarked? Um, and if you can then follow up with, you know, maybe some of the issues that you've personally struggled with in terms of these particular interfaces and setting them up or working within them, and maybe hint at what, you know, could be uh, looked at from a scholarly perspective, for example, in, in terms of what could help inform some of your work uh, at these interfaces. So if, if you may maybe uh, jump in, you know, uh, Dr. Fam or Dr. Mueller, whoever wants to take the floor. Okay, maybe I'm the one at the national level where I can describe the situation, which is uh, interesting because France has had a long history, a very strong role in terms of diplomacy and still have a, a, a huge network uh, of diplomatic uh, uh, um, embassies in the world uh, regarding the size of France. We are the third network with more than 150 embassies all, all over the world. And although the staff have been decreasing these last years, we still have quite a significant number of uh, science attaché or science counselors uh, everywhere. Um, interestingly, uh, in France, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a, a state uh, is very uh, is one of the most important uh, ministry, and uh, is in charge of everything which happens abroad, including uh, science cooperation. Of course, they have interaction at the national level with the Ministry of uh, Higher Education, Research, and uh, and uh, Innovation. But uh, interestingly, our position as attaché or counselor are not depending on the Ministry of Higher Education and Research, but directly depending on the Foreign Affairs Ministry, which means that in our mission, although our background is more in science, our role is more in diplomacy. So the challenge for us, our individual challenge or the, the, the team challenge is to bring science to the diplomats and uh, the uh, um, other way around which is not easy. And I think it's maybe, well, now I have an experience in both sides of the, of the river, if I can say. And uh, I would say that the, the most difficult thing is the language, the culture. I mean, in France, we have quite, um, how to say, narrow silos of education. I mean, if you study diplomacy at Sciences Po uh, or, or um, um, now the name has changed and I'm lost. It's not in I anymore, but uh, the equivalent. And on the other hand, you have physicists, chemists, mathematicians, which are really strictly in their in their um, in their uh, track. Um, Jean Christophe Maudu and myself, we are examples of people who 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 have uh, changed their 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 their. Their, their path and went from science to more uh, science diplomacy. But still, it's difficult. The, the, the dialogue is difficult because on both sides, we are quite reluctant in discussing with the other side. I mean, for the diplomats, science appears as complex, difficult, uh, difficult to explain, difficult to understand. As for the scientists, they cannot go to uh, uh, yes or no answers. They, they, they know that they um, need time. They cannot really explain in a simple words what they are doing, etc. So I think that the difficulty is mainly, it's not the structure, but the culture, at least in our country. And uh, of course, in my capacity and the capacity of my colleagues, the, the challenge is to make the two community talk together. And it's especially important when we have, we're facing big problems like the pandemic, for instance. You know that between France and the, and, and, and the UK at the moment, the political situation is not at its best. And even the diplomats fully understand that there are still communication among the scientific communities on both sides of the channel. We are still, well, the scientists are still speaking together 
wanting to work together. And the diplomats understand that the diplomacy of influence needs to bring together not only the politicians who are now in a very difficult uh, time of their dialogue, but have to, 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 to use all kinds of influence and, 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 converse, uh, and dialogue. And for the moment, in my position here, I think that science diplomacy is really at stake and is particularly important at a moment when the political dialogue is difficult. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kam. Yes, uh, Dr. Mueller, you wanted to hear, react. I can, yeah, I can build on this. Well, you need to understand that, of course, foreign and security policies are among the most sensitive policy areas for any country. And that's why in the European Union, we have unanimity voting on foreign and security files. There is no qualified majority voting. So we need for any position of the EU, we need a consensus of all the 27 member states, all of them. Now I can tell you if at least there is a common understanding of the scientific evidence, this helps already a lot in brokering a common understanding and brokering common positions. And that's why it is so important that we have science advisors at the national level as well. Um, now, when I started here, um, what I, I, I thought it would be good to have a kind of a, a network of people like me who are in similar positions in, in the member uh, states. So I went to the different foreign ministries. And of course, I'm aware there's the setups as usual are very different because that's the European diversity. And, and I told them, I don't care what your job title is. I want to know who's the voice of science in your house. Okay, and some said, okay, here's our department head for international science cooperation. And the other said, here's our special envoy for science diplomacy. Here's our ambassador at large for research and innovation. All fine, I don't care about the job title, but you're the ones who kind of stand up for science and speak for science in the house. Um, and um, that's, that's of course helps a lot to, to bring these, these, these guys together and to discuss together on, on various issues that are on the political agenda. Um, of course, there were also some member states who frankly told me, sorry, we don't have anybody uh, dealing with science in our foreign ministry. So that's, that's of course also the reality because it's uh, an evolving topic and not everybody has yet discovered, so to speak, um, the role of science and science diplomacy, but but I, have, I think two thirds of them already together. So it's 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 advancing, it's developing, it's very helpful actually, as we have this unanimity voting also to to get common understandings. Uh, I must say here in the house within the European External Action Service, I only find open doors. Wherever I go, there's nobody who ever questions why should we consult science or ask science. So it's, so they, there's really an interest in it. Of course, most of them are more used to talk to foreign and security policy think tanks and find it difficult to engage with epidemiologists and, and similar strange disciplines. So that's why I can help them a bit. And, and you know, we have a readings digest. It's a kind of newsletter all the diplomats get once a week with, with, with kind of think tank pieces. And since I'm here, they also get to read science and nature and lands and these sort of things which are kind of smuggled into their, their, their weekly newsletter. Um, to get to get him used to to dealing with with scientific literature, literature as well. Now, where I find it, what I find challenging, what is difficult, is to get traction at the top level. And and the issue is not that the people wouldn't be interested. On the contrary, I mean, the high representative, uh, Mr. Borrell, he was president of the European University Institute, so he ac actually has an academic background. He's interested. He really, when he gets he gets a graph or figure, he really asks, where does this come from, and and how should I interpret this, and so on. Um, but of course, these guys, they are driven by the day-to-day -day disasters and catastrophes, because every day somewhere in the world, there is a coup d'etat, an earthquake, a volcanic eruption, an assassinated uh, journalist, uh, election fraud, uh, armed conflict, you, may, you name it. And, and I find it always amazing that when you get an agenda for a meeting next week, that by the time you arrive at the meeting, the agenda has completely changed because of everything that happened in the meantime. So that's that's actually really the, the, the challenge, the main challenge, really to always kind of remind people that actually science is, is there, science is there to help you, but of course to understand also that science and technology are also drive off many of these of many of these issues, you know, um, artificial intelligence and so on, and there, there are a whole, whole, whole lot of geopolitics around it. So so um yes, it's it's a kind of a uh, daily struggle in a way, but but um, but at the same time, I must say, I really only find open doors for it. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mueller, for, for this. Um, so th there's quite a few topics that you both have mentioned that are uh, quite quite core and I think maybe of interest to the young scholars to, to dig into, right? And uh, uh, one of uh, which, uh, Dr. Pham, you've mentioned is potentially the disconnect between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Science in certain countries and the way that these interfaces can be brought together uh, via certain mechanisms, whether it is you know, working groups, science advisors, uh, other kinds of, of uh, mechanisms, which may vary from country to country, obviously. So very interesting point. Um, also, you mentioned the, the, the silos, educational silos, which happen in, in many countries across the globe. We don't yet have a full track in, say, science diplomacy, even science policy, which has been around for, you know, uh, for more than 50 years now, in a way, um, doesn't have those clear tracks. So I think the, we can discuss maybe some of the silos, educational silos, also with Ms. O'Hara and Dr. Bala Christian, which uh, have also have different backgrounds and may have uh, further thoughts on, on the topic. Um, and uh, also uh, something that Dr. Muir mentioned was um, the mapping process of where are the voices of science in each country and each organizations, right? And uh, we know that there is uh, a lot of mapping that needs to be done. And I know Dr. Muir that you have been very active trying to map those uh, those voices of science, as you call them, and the International Network for Science Government Advice have been trying to do so. And I'm, I'm also pleased to report that some of our students in the master's program will be embarking on su such mapping as well and love to work with you on this, as you know. And uh, finally, is the question of the different timelines between science and diplomacy on which these operate, and that may be point of friction, as you say, agendas are constant, constantly changing in the world of diplomacy and how those science keep up in forming the short term as well as the long term uh, in terms of, the, of those issues of science diplomacy. So thank you very much for digging into some of those issues um, that I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll discuss further. So maybe uh, moving on to maybe the, the, the regional the international uh, realm, uh, as well as the, the potential sometimes lack of capacity in certain areas of the world that actually direly need some of those interfaces. Maybe we can go to uh, Ms. Ohira and, and if you, you can maybe share your thoughts about this and then maybe Dr. Balakrishnan, you can, you can um, uh, follow up with maybe some of your experiences the UN in the UN uh, and in the Geneva area as well as being an ambassador yourself. So seeing the other side of the, uh, of the, of the coin, if you will. So maybe, uh, Ms. Arya, do you wanna further uh, highlight some of those regional international capacity issues? Yes, uh, thanks, JT. And I'll pick on some of the ideas that were you know, mentioned before. I think in, in looking at some of the challenges and in thinking about how we can overcome or better address them in a more pragmatic way is yes, there are different communities, different languages, different interests. You know, uh, scientists work in a very different way than diplomats and policymakers do. Their academic training is very different. You know, scientists usually are more used to working together, you know, the whole process of scientific development, you know, the peer review process, and a former minister of science technology of Argentina once said, it's easier for me as a scientist to speak with my scientific colleagues, right? We agreed on most of the language and the terms and the concepts and the methodologies, but it's much harder for me to negotiate with my former, you know, <laughs> with my colleagues who are other ministers of science technologies from other countries and other regions because they are not always the same agenda. Uh, and that kind of gives you an idea of the differences of the communities, the agendas, you know, that they have, the points of view that they have to defend in their national scientific interests, of course, so there are many things. The other thing I think that the um, panelists mentioned is the um, importance of science in the whole decision-making process. And uh, as we all know, um, public policy especially, in making decisions, they have to take into account a number of factors and science is only one element, sometimes not even the most important. Uh, sometimes the economy you know, has much more important um, weight in the whole decision-making process. Uh, having said that, I think it's also a challenge in our responsibility to be able to 
improve the mechanisms, not only what we inform, but how we inform. You know, we know that scientists sometimes have a difficulty in communicating their science, in communicating well in a short way, in a language that is understood uh, by, you know, civil society, by the public, by policymakers. So the responsibility comes from both sides, not only policymaking and policymakers into understanding and taking that evidence into account, but also scientists are people who really want to make the case of the value of the science. Um, even in governments that are not so open or so keen in having, you know, uh, science evidence being part of the whole decision-making process is a matter of also educating the public. The public in many countries decide who the governments are, who the policymakers are. So also it's a role of informing the public of the value, you know, the science, the evidence about climate change, about COVID pandemic and other issues that are, you know, important to society and why policymaking should take evidence scientific evidence into account. So I think there are many challenges. Of course, our tradition and our academic educational system is in such a way that is uh, very disciplinary based. You know, you are an expert in biology or in physics or in, you know, hydrology. Um, and most of the challenges, global challenges today cannot be answered or tackled by a single discipline. Uh, so how can we promote uh, the, what we call, especially in global environmental sciences, you know, a new science that take into account, you know, transdisciplinary research, which is not only, you know, um, areas of knowledge from science coming from natural sciences, engineering, social sciences, biological sciences, medical areas, um, but also bringing to the discussion from the very beginning, you know, policymakers. If we continue working in silos, if we continue just communicating at the very end process of the research, you know, most likely that evidence is not going to be taken into account. If uh, the people who use that information is not considered in the whole definition of the research, and what are the questions that need to be tackled, and how that's going to be taken into account, what our demands are what are the concerns are in the time frame? You know, do I need this today? Do I need it in 10 years? Um, so I think the importance and more and more, especially when dealing with uh, global environmental change is more the transdisciplinary approach that not only collaboration with experts from different knowledges of science, but also policymakers who are part of the research team right from the very beginning in the co-design of the research and the methodologies. So I think this is another important aspect that we need to take into account. And I think that also facilitates a lot of some of what we, uh, I consider to be key components of this whole science policy, science diplomacy collaboration, which is, you know, um, dialogue, we need to have dialogue among different areas of scientific um, knowledge communities, but also with the different communities of science and policymakers, and also other stakeholders, including civil society and the public uh, in, the, in the public in a, in a general frame. Uh, but also in terms of uh, you know developing trust and developing credibility and developing ways that we understand each other and the different demands. Uh, what we can provide in terms of uh, scientific knowledge and, you know, what are the uncertainties, but still that we have to make decisions at the end of the day. Um, the other aspect, which I think is without trust and without dialogue, it's very difficult to engage in productive collaboration, whether it is among scientists or among scientists with policymakers. So I think those are some important components that we probably need to discuss and develop pragmatic programs that tackle them and can really make a contribution to developing those more productive networks where the science is there, where the policy making is there, and you know you have this dialogue, the trust, and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sarah, for for these remarks. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I think that. Uh, you know, Dr. Balakrishnan, you may have a lot of say, uh, a lot to say about um, maybe this kind of multidisciplinary approach uh, as, you know, being a scientist by training and then an ambassador 
and working, you know, uh, at the contact of the United Nations for so many years. So if you want to give, uh, give some remarks as well on these aspects. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this has been a very interesting discussion. So uh, generally what we observe, uh, now there are at least three or four major international negotiations going on, which our young scholars would find interesting to follow. The first is of course the climate change discussions. The second is the UN uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, the UN BBNJ conference, which actually is covering 71% of the earth's surface, the oceans. So that is now almost reached the stage of a treaty-based negotiation. And there are, it's a complex issue, but very important, but hardly has any public attention. Uh, the third is the uh, effort in the WHO to work out a new instrument for dealing with future pandemics. Now here again, there is a sharp division among countries. Some want a legally binding instrument. Uh, some are apprehensive about what goes into it. So now my point is that in most case, when most of these negotiations, there are many delegations, especially from developing countries who are insufficiently prepared uh, to bring out their interests and what they consider as key in interests from their side. And what happens because of this is you end up with a decision or a treaty or whatever it is, and then you have to go for damage fixing because some of the things you, which were important to you were not included. So what we need to fix this is we must have much better coordination among all the key players in the science and technology ecosystem, national ecosystem. In India, we have eight science ministries and a whole lot of other ministries which do as science and technology. They hardly speak to each other. Each one works in their own silo. Nuclear energy, atomic uh, space is a another department. So. I'm sure this happens in many other countries, even in advanced countries. So there's a problem of better coordination among government agencies dealing with science and technology on key issues. Uh, then beyond the science and technology actors, you have to engage with legislators, political parties, leaders, and civil society opinion makers, because the awareness of science and technology issues among them is very poor. Examples, and this creates a fear of technology. Uh, there is a fear of GM. There is a fear of artificial intelligence based on insufficient awareness. So uh, the, you know, at, at, there's a lot of work to be done as far as coordinating and creating of awareness at the national level. Then when you talk about transboundary regional issues, I'm glad we had somebody from Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, one example where coordination could be better is the health of large marine ecosystems. For example, in India, we have two large marine ecosystems, the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. But there's hardly any coordination among the countries, the coastal states, in managing the, these two ecosystems, which are at very high risk. Now, almost there are 66 such large marine ecosystems identified across the world by GEF. And I would say that a high percentage of these ecosystems are at high risk of uh, losing their biodiversity. And there's not enough of uh, management by the coastal states. So just one example of uh, how things need to be fixed at the regional level. Regional cooperation can make a big difference in issues like health, air and water pollution, uh, things which are mm -hmm. relatively short range problems which go across country. Now let's come to the international scene. Now, you know, the international organizations, unfortunately, uh, while challenges, global challenges have grown, the capacity of international organizations to deal with them has weakened. Uh, every year, there is a struggle to get enough regular budget. Payment of contributions by member states is late. There is financial stress on all these organizations. And there is a continuous uh, effort, particularly by some large contributors, to cut down programs and activities. This is a very short-sighted view. Now, example is what is happening this week in the WHO. They are discussing how to fix the WHO. And it's a typical example. Seven, only 17% of the funding of WHO comes from the regular budget, assessed contributions. The rest, 83% uh, comes from voluntary contributions. So they have to chase uh, donors uh, to get these funds and the donors have their own demands. Now, when it comes to increasing the regular budget, 
certain large contributors, I won't name them, they always oppose it because their main objective is to cut down payments to international organizations. So it's no use expecting international organizations to help in meeting global challenges unless we fund them enough. Now, how do we get, uh, you know, reverse this trend? I think we have to go to civil society and outside the government. You go to states in the US, for example, the US pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but large states like New York and California said we'll stick to it. So I think you have to build support for better and more stable funding of international organizations uh, by working with subnational entities, state, local governments, cities, uh, corporations, all kinds of people. I think there's enough, uh, this has not really been done. We have left too much in the hands of uh, simply governments to run international organizations. So I think uh, some of these issues are very interesting. We need to, I think there's a lot of work which can be done on them. And I hope uh, that this particular webinar will lead to all that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Balakrishnan, for, for sharing um, this, these remarks with, with us. Uh, and uh, thank you also, Ms. Oyer, for you both really highlighted uh, that there are pressing international scientific global challenges that need these interfaces uh, quite desperately. And uh, we're still maybe at the stage of actually mapping those interfaces, uh, whether it is regional or international, uh, even before we can, you know, uh, as Ms. Herrera said, understand the what and then the how, you know, it, it is best communicated science and uh, in the diplomatic settings is, is, is uh, communicated. So uh, in a way you've, you've highlighted that the, the, the field here of science diplomacy and the, what the young scholars and, and other scholars that may uh, write about this is still quite wide open in terms of, of themes of, of research. Um, and that it, it is, uh, as Ms. Oyera noted, uh, very multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary even in terms of the, the, the research that is required to address uh, these issues. So thank you very much for bringing that uh, to the fore and, and, and to this audience, I think is very, very relevant. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I realize that we're uh, running a little bit behind, but we started late. So apologies for, for this. If you can uh, bear with us for another you know, couple of uh, minutes, maybe five or 10 maximum, just so that we get one or two questions from the audience and, and engage them a little bit uh, after your remarks. Um, so maybe just to transition to some uh, of the questions um, in, in the chat, there are some that were posted. Uh, obviously, a few, quite a few graduate students already career researchers, uh, really trying to understand how to get into the field of science diplomacy and get the experience. And the four of you have very different educational backgrounds and, and, and pathways into the world of science diplomacy. So if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing, maybe in a, just a, you know, one or two minutes maximum um, for the sake of time, you know, some of those pathways that you may know about, um, that, that would be great, I think. Yes, Dr. Bakrishnan. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll be very brief here. I can say a lot on this. I think one of the things you do as a scientist, and you, especially when you go on to PhD and so on, is you try to do more and more about a much narrower field. So, you know, you, you spend all your time doing one or two problems in a very restricted area of science and technology. I think that it should not be the only thing. As a scientist, you should, first of all, keep yourself abreast of what's happening in the entire area of science and technology, because you never know development in one field may have applications in another. Secondly, it's not enough just to keep up with science and technology. You have to keep up with global economics, national uh, economics, sociology, and other subjects, because that is how actually science and technology makes an impact on society. So if you have, keep your interest wide enough and interact with a wide range of stakeholders, you will actually come across problems where you would feel that you have, you can contribute. And you, sh you should write about these, publish them in the newspapers, publish them in journals, uh, science diplomacy, but keep your interests wide, keep yourself informed about what's happening around and in the world. And I think you'll find plenty of things you can do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balakrishnan. And I think Dr. Pham is next. Yes, please. Yeah. 
Uh, you just muted yourself, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what has been said uh, just now. And uh, I agree that having being a specialist in a very narrow uh, field uh, is not enough and you have to open your mind. But it's also important to have to be to be uh, I don't know the word exactly, but to be legitimate uh, as a scientist. I mean, you, you, you build the trust of other people in your capacity of dealing seriously with a given problem. So that after that, you can open to other disciplines. So I, I, I would like to say that the, the main words, the, the take home message I, I would like to, 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 to leave here is that, well, we, we talk about interdisciplinary and it's very important that STEM and social science and humanities work together because no challenges could be uh, solved by only one disciplinary approach. So interdisciplinary is very important. Communication issues, not only to a large public, but also between communities. And the network is very important too. And then trust and respect, which is something that we have to apply to every kind of, of relationship we have. And also being trustable and being, uh, I mean, people have to trust you when you talk. So that, that would be the main messages for me. Thank you. Uh, and I think Dr. Müller wanted to follow up and then Ms. Weyer. Yes, I have to say, I never studied science advice or science diplomacy. I, I not even ever attended a training on it. So, so it's really training on the job. Um, what helps, of course, as a scientist first that you move around as, a, as scientists often do, move to other countries, understand different cultures. And that's, this already helps a lot. Um, what was mentioned already, science communication is essential. Try to explain what you do to your grandmother, even if it's the most weird field of science. Uh, very important. Um, if you are interested in science policy interface, try to understand how politics work. What I did is during my student times, I engaged in local politics, which was very helpful. Because if you are in a town hall meeting and try to understand uh, the citizens, why the wind turbine is going to be built in a backyard, and you start to understand the pressures and the stakeholders and the bargaining and all the rest of it, which of course we, you will see then also at a big scale and in, in my case at a European level. So that's very important. And, and of course, um, yes, you come in as a specialist, um, but as a scientist, of course, we have some common understanding of what peer review is. We all deal with data and statistics. That's all common to, to all the disciplines. And of course, there's a bit of jargon which is kind of works each day. Um, and uh, so this, this, of course, then helps to also to, to ask then also the general question. I always say, since the day that I explained to Mr. Barroso the Higgs boson, since then nothing scares me. Very nice. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miller. Ms. Sarah, please. Hey, thanks, JC. Yeah, just, I guess, picking up on some of what the um, panelists have said, um, I, I think it's very important that scientists, you know, are good at what they do. They're, they have to be excellent at their science and what they can bring to the table in tackling those, you know, regional global challenges. So even when we speak of multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary research, we're speaking of bringing the best science from different areas of the scientific field. So that's one of the things that the panelists have said, and it's very important. Um, I'm not a scientist by training. Uh, my background is more international affairs, but I had to learn how to work with scientists from different areas and different fields in different countries. Um, as an international civil servant, I work for 19 governments. And uh, my role here, my job is to listen to what the government's priorities are, what they need, and try to match that with the best scientific knowledge community um, experts that we work with from the entire Americas. So doing this exercising of matching, you know, government priorities, needs, interest with scientific community, knowledge, expertise, institutions, networks. At the same time that we are trying to keep, you know, ahead in thinking about what are the capacities for forming the next generation of not only scientists, but also policymakers, also brokers of the scientific information to support decision making, and also of science diplomats and science advisors. So at the same time, they are currently 
addressing the current challenges, you also have to keep an eye you know, ahead and, and take into account what the needs are today and preparing for the needs of tomorrow. Working under a collaborative framework, working with different communities that is not always easy because they have different interests, they have different agendas, they have different timeframes, but also that's why it's so important to be open, to be flexible, to be collaborative, to be respectful. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. It was delightful to participate uh, on the panel. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sarah, and thank, thank you everyone for, for this wonderful last, uh, last set of comments. I mean, on my end, I, I wish we could have even like three hours to discuss all this, given the, the breadth of, of expertise, the breadth of um, uh, different uh, you know, experiences and, and different positions on those science diplomacy interfaces. So uh, I feel very uh, lucky to have been uh, here to, to moderate and listen to your insights. And I'm, I'm sure the, the audience in the room as well. Um, and uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm very sorry for, for the audience if we weren't able to um, you know, pick up uh, so many of your questions I saw pop in, in the chat, unfortunately, an hour and 15 minutes is is very tight, uh, especially with this uh, breadth of, of expertise that we have in the room. But I hope it was nonetheless insightful, and I hope it helped uh, inform um, more some of your potential research on science diplomacy and why it's crucial to do so, why it's crucial to keep working on these issues, and to um, inform policymakers, but also people working at the, at the interfaces on uh, on on the latest uh, research to to um, to make sure that they have the best information and tools at their disposal so thank you again very much uh, to the four uh, of our panelists and i will um hand it over very shortly to uh dr benson to to uh wrap up the event and talk about the next event which as dr bella christian mentioned uh, too much is in the hands of government sometimes we will have a look at non-state actors and underrepresented communities in science diplomacy, which is a, an extremely uh, key issue to consider, uh, given all of your uh, previous remarks. So thank you very much. And I will give the floor back to you, uh, Adriana. So thank you again. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our moderator and our panelists for a great discussion today. I really appreciate your participation. And would also like to thank UCL Steve and our outreach partners for partnering with us on this event. Um, I'll share again our call for papers and events um, so you all can see what's coming up. So if you're inspired by the ideas today, check out our call for papers. The deadline is in April. And we will have our next event coming up on February 15th focused on inclusivity and in science diplomacy and raising the voices of non-state actors and underrepresented communities and global science issues. The webinar will look at equity, inclusion, and diversity issues in science oh, diplomacy with a particular emphasis on the intergenerational gap. Oh, somebody is, okay, great. Um, and then in March, we will have a writing workshop that will, you'll hear about this soon, um, but we will do provide opportunities to practice writing and also have a speaker about writing, writing about science diplomacy. So we do wanna offer some training as well, in addition to these really great discussions um, to prepare you to submit to the issue. So I'll share our channels again, but um, we also encourage you to check out our trainings um, that are on our YouTube channel. And again, we'll be posting this one as well, but um, you can keep up to date with our next events and issues and other opportunities through our newsletter. So we encourage you to sign up for that as well. And feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about the call for papers or the journal, we'd we'll be happy to answer and looking forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your week.